During this presentation, I want to describe the 2018 eruption of Kilauea and how the Volcano Observatory communicated with the public and government agencies during this time of crisis. The eruption actually took place in two different areas. Lava flows were erupted in the lower east rift zone, and uh, this is an area in which a lot of people live. But 40 or 50 kilometers farther west is the summit of the volcano, and uh, it has a caldera that has developed above the principal magma storage region for Kilauea. And part of this caldera collapsed during the eruption. Magma is fed from the summit through the East Rift connector into the East Rift zone, which uh, in turn carries uh, lava down to the site of eruption in uh, the lower Puna area. Pu'u'o'o is a prominent cone that formed on the East Rift Zone between 1983 and 2018, and its demise uh, took place at the beginning of the eruption and uh, will be described in the next slide. Starting in March of uh, 2018, this line across uh, Pu'u'o'o began to uh, lengthen, and uh, this indicated uh, increasing pressurization at Pu'u'o'o to the extent that HVO um, issued a warning that a new vent could form uh, either here or farther along the uh, East Rift Zone. And indeed, on April 30th, a barrier underground near Pu'u'o'o broke because of the increasing pressure, and uh, the floor of Pu'u'o'o crater collapsed and magma began to inject into the East Rift Zone down toward the uh, area where people live in Leilani Estates and beyond. On the 1st of May, HVO issued a warning to residents that an eruption is possible. The possibility became a reality late in the afternoon of May 3rd when the eruption began in the Leilani Estates area. Fissures uh, opened over a, about a seven kilometer long stretch of the uh, East Rift Zone. Uh, the lava flows that were erupted at this time were small and didn't advance very far. And it was interesting that they were uh, cooler and uh, more chemically evolved, it turns out, than the uh, magma within the Rift Zone uh, farther up Rift. And uh, that's because the magma uh, uh, that was uh, erupting it um, probably intersected or pushed out magma that had been stored from 1955 and older um, eruptions. To add insult to injury, on May 4th, a magnitude 6.9 earthquake took place, the largest in Hawaii since 1975. Uh, the blue vectors indicate uh, direction of ground motion uh, is determined by a, a GPS measurements. Bridget will discuss this event more, but in general we feel that the earthquake was triggered by the pressurization caused by magma injecting into the rift zone, uh, shoving the uh, south flank of the volcano seaward uh, along a, a detachment fault that is uh, six to seven kilometers beneath the uh, beneath sea level. This slide shows the development of the flow field in Lower Puna. It started small, uh, but in uh, late May, uh, Fisher 8, which was one of the earlier fissures, resumed activity. And it, it uh, extruded the lion's share of the lava during the entire eruption. Uh, the total volume for the uh, of lava erupted is something like one, one and a half cubic kilometers. And by far, most of it came out of uh, Fisher 8. And notice the very small neck there toward the north end of the flow field that the lava had to pour through. It, it's pretty incredible that most of the uh, 1.5 cubic kilometers passed through that small neck. As this was going on, the caldera, 40 or 50 kilometers farther west, began to collapse. This little uh, movie shows the uh, collapse of the southern part of the caldera. It started out by 
widening of Halemauma'u, which is that uh, crater that you see uh, near the middle of the slide. Uh, and it is, for scale, it is about a kilometer in diameter. See, it is uh, collapsing and uh, widening gradually, and then eventually a, a much larger portion of the caldera floor is involved uh, uh, in the collapse, which had ended by around uh, August uh, 11th uh, or so. The total amount of collapse of Halemauma'u was more than 500 meters, but the collapse was incremental. If we concentrate on the upper panel in this slide, you can see that there was a, a, a general um, dropping down of the caldera as measured by a GPS station called Cal-S. But um, this gradual down dropping was punctuated by uh, periods of very rapid down dropping a few seconds that uh, typically took uh, occurred um, every uh, 20 to 40 hours and amounted to a drop of something like a, a meter and a half or so. Um, this uh, was uh, unexpected, and uh, but it looks like that uh, uh, other uh, caldera collapses and other volcanoes in the world for which we have data, and there aren't very many data certainly, uh, indicate that the collapses there may be um, incremental um, as well. The lower plot uh, shows uh, uh, the tilt at the UWD location. Uh, it it uh, shows that every time that the caldera floor at Cal-S dropped down, the tilt jumped up because the system was becoming repressurized re as the caldera floor was pushing down into the, into the magma uh, itself. Quite a remarkable um, process, processes that were taking place here at the summit. Of course, a large eruption like this has to have its biggest and most this one did. At the summit, uh, this was the largest uh, collapse volume that's been measured at Kilauea. The measurements date from the uh, earlier middle 1800s, about 850 million cubic meters. There were more than 62 collapse events, these incremental downdrops, that uh, were accompanied by magnitude of about, about 5.3 earthquakes. Uh, residents of nearby communities were shaken uh, physically and, and sometimes mentally by this kind of activity. On the lower east rift zone, it was the most luminous eruption in the past 200 years, uh, about a 1.5 cubic kilometers. Uh, it had the highest sustained uh, lava discharge rate of greater than 30 kilometers per hour, which is, causes us to uh, rethink uh, the hazards that lava flows can pose under favorable circumstances. And then it produced the highest sulfur dioxide emission rates measured at Kilauea, uh, rather than a few hundred tons per day, up, up greater than 30,000 tons per day. And then we can't forget that on the south flank of the volcano, there was this magnitude 6.9 earthquake that occurred, the largest in Hawaii since 1975, it's kind of gotten buried in, in everything else that happened, but if it had occurred by itself, it would have been front page news. Well, as you can imagine, the eruption had a very widespread and sobering impacts on society. I'm not going to go through all this list. You can read it uh, as I'm talking and you can add many more things to it. More than 700 houses destroyed, thousands of people displaced, and many of these people had marginal incomes to begin with. Um, many bad air days because of the SO2. Uh, one thing that deserves more attention, I think, is that the, the sustained uncertainty, uh, stress, anxiety caused by the, the more than uh, three-month-long eruption. You know, when's it going to end? How can I handle this? We lost 22% of the electricity uh, on the island, and we still don't have it back. It's due back in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, get on the list, uh, inaccessible boat ramp. This might not seem a big deal to you, but boating 
is very important in Hawaii, in the culture of the Hawaiians as well as other people. Um, this was the only boat ramp for, along a hundred miles of coastline which one could get his boat into the water. Uh, vacation losses, uh, agricultural losses, national park tourism. It's, it's amazing uh, the impacts that this eruption had on society. How did HVO um, keep the public informed as what was going on in the uh, gov other governmental agencies like Civil Defense and National Park Service? We had frequent uh, meetings with them. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our uh, uh, observatory scientists was stationed at the Civil Defense Office all the time. Uh, we communicated directly to the public um, via uh, web and social media, uh, email. Social media, incidentally, has uh, played a pretty big role. And the people who were involved with that um, say that, well, you, you know, there are pluses and minuses, but probably the pluses outweighed the minuses, the use of social media, even though that's the biggest source of rumors. We had more than 12 uh, meetings with the community, um, and then the more traditional media, newspapers, television, maps, and hazards reports. One thing that is probably is very unusual in Hawaii is that we've had many years of oral and, and uh, print contacts with the public. We give, many, we give frequent um, talks to the public. We have a weekly column in the newspaper. It's also put on our website called Volcano Watch. And so members of, of the community that attended those meetings over the years, read the Volcano Watch, were uh, better able to cope probably than the vast majority, unfortunately, of the public that uh, didn't pay much attention to that kind of, of background. But the bottom line is that we, we do have, with, with the civil defense, with the park service, of course, and with the public, a, a pretty strong background on which to build during the 2018 crisis. This is an example of the public statement that the observatory made on May 1st, just after the magma had started to inject into the rift zone. The first paragraph uh, explains what was happening, and the second paragraph gives our best prognosis for what might happen. And this is, uh, in public statements, this is what we always try to do, to say what's happening and what might happen. Reports that we gave to government uh, agencies, such as this one, to Hawaii County Civil Defense, are um, a little more technical than the reports that we issued to the general public. And uh, they, we try to go through uh, the same information, though, as what's been happening, what could likely happen. Overall, I think that uh, the response of the scientific community to the eruption was was outstanding. Um, but as always, there are you know issues that uh, come to the fore that we can discuss. One of them is that um, I think that uh, research has to be an integral part of any eruption response. Now, this was not a, a problem in the area where lava flows were erupting. I think people did a great job in, in gathering data uh, for use in for erupt, uh, research purposes. Um, but at the summit, it was not so well uh, organized. Uh, we could have done more in the way of field work, uh, making observations during the eruption. And why do we want to do it during eruptions? Well, we want to improve what we can tell the public the next time around. And the only way that you can do that is to improve your understanding, and that is gained by doing research during a time of crisis. 
And then an issue that everybody raises and there's, uh, is the, there are too many cooks in the kitchen. Many agencies were involved um, with their own agendas. It's certainly frustrating for the scientists who after all are the experts about the eruption. They are the experts and yet they are often, they are sometimes being denied access to areas where they could learn more about the eruption. It takes valuable time to negotiate for access to an eruption site and uh, it's really frustrating. This might be an insurmountable problem. I don't know, but I guess I'm enough of an optimist to think that maybe at times at least there can be some prior understanding so agencies controlling land access will realize that the scientists should have uh, a different kind of uh, means of access than the uh, general public. The eruption affords us an opportunity to kind of uh, look bigger than we were before. It's uh, in a sense it kind of allows us to um, think about long-term planning, uh, both uh, regarding what the volcano is likely to do next. Is it going to be in repose? Is it going to be explosive? Uh, and also in thinking uh, about the observatory, since it's, we're having to build a new building and we're getting new people and big, big things like that have to be considered. It's also brought to the forefront uh, an awareness of explosive hazards, which is dear, dear to my heart and uh, I think has been uh, underappreciated up to the present. Also, there were several uh, vulnerabilities that um, came out in the eruption. Uh, one is that there weren't very many uh, uh, escape routes in the lower Pune area, and I think that that should be taken care of. Uh, we need more uh, re system redundancy at HVO regarding um, our uh, monitoring um, our data transmissions. And then I've already discussed some of the issues about uh, interagency coordination. Overall, though, I think that this eruption was a, um, a good example of how the Volcano Observatory and its cooperating scientists from universities um, really uh, dealt with the eruption very, very well. And uh, I think uh, we can only go uh, into, the next, into the future thinking that uh, being rather proud of how we handled this event and thinking that we'll be able to deal with the next big event in Hawaii, which may well be an eruption of Mauna Loa. Thank you very much.